Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're calling in from today from around the world. My name is Sarah Mundell, and I support the Laudato Si Action Platform from Indianapolis in the United States as a communications specialist. I invite you, if you haven't yet, to introduce yourself in the chat uh, with your name, where you're coming from, and then just brief two words, what have you learned from the creator about care for the earth and all people? I also welcome you today on behalf of the whole team that works for the Laudato Si Action Platform and those who've helped prepare this webinar for everyone today. The platform is a project of the Vatican's Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development with the operational support of the Laudato Si movement and built together with the contribution of many organizations around the world who are working with us to foster culture and practice of integral ecology. It's inspired by Pope Francis's encyclical letter, Laudato Si, on care for our common home. Laudato Si means praise be to you in the Italian dialect used by St. Francis in his canticle of creation. So participants of the platform undergo a journey of self-assessment and reflection about their lifestyles and practices, and with support of the platform form concrete plans to go out and take actions that reflect a more holistic approach to today's ecological and social crises. All of our participants, many of you, come from a variety of sectors, from individuals and families to dioceses and parishes, religious communities and congregations, schools and universities, healthcare institutions, economic entities and various groups and organizations. They work towards seven Laudato Si goals, including responding to the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor, ecological education, ecological spirituality, ecological economics, adoption of sustainable lifestyles, and community resilience. Today's webinar on connecting faith and action hopes to support your understanding of that link between the science of ecology and our faith and how our understanding of God can help shape the way we act as stewards of creation and provide some concrete examples of how platform participants can take action in, to support the Laudato Si goals. And we'll have more on that soon. First, just a few practical announcements. If you need translation, we are offering translations in Spanish, Italian, French, or Portuguese. You can access them through the interpretations button at the bottom of your screen. Click the interpretations button then choose your language. Then this webinar is being recorded and live streamed on YouTube. Only our designated speakers will be visible and we hope you will save the YouTube link to rewatch or share later. Third, if you have any questions during the webinar, please submit them by clicking the Q&A button at any time. Any question put in the regular chat may get lost, so please use the Q&A button and we'll answer as many as we can then thank you for helping us build this global community together today by keeping any chat participation on topic and made in a spirit of respect and openness. If you'd like to look at our netiquette guidelines, which you agreed to on your registration, you can find them at the link in the chat. Finally, if you'd like to attend this month's community meeting immediately following the webinar and haven't registered yet, you can still do so at the link uh, in the chat now. The community meeting will be on a different Zoom link, so make sure to complete your registration. We look forward to continuing our discussion there with all who can make it. So now a quick look at our upcoming agenda. In just a moment, we'll have a prayer from Sister Hel Helen Galadima of the School Sisters of Notre Dame. Then greetings from the Laudato Si Action Platform Director, John Mundell. And then we'll hear from our main speakers, Alberto Palecci, who leads the Faith and Sustainability Initiative at the World Resources Institute, WRI, and Father Peter Rajic, a Jesuit priest who directs the Integral Ecology Research Network at the Laudato Si Research Institute of the University of Oxford. Then hopefully we'll have some time for a few questions and answers. So again, please feel free to put those in the Q&A section throughout our program. We'll conclude with a few announcements before we sign off and get ready for the community meeting, which will immediately following this Zoom in a different Zoom link. So now I will invite Sister Helen Galamita to lead us in prayer. Sister Helen is a sister of the School Sisters of Notre Dame. She is originally from Northeast Nigeria and speaks Huasa, Jukun, and English. Right now she works in Sunyani, Ghana, 
as a teacher of English at Notre Dame Girls Senior High School. She teaches with the mind to support the girls to become better future leaders with the world vision and appreciates being part of the Laudato Si movement, which helps her better care for God's creation. Sister Helen also serves as the Shalom Africa branch representative in her congregation. So uh, she has recorded her prayer ahead of time and I'll ask our tech team to start that now. And we'll just maybe start that again because we don't hear what she's saying. And I'll just ask Ed uh, if he can start the video again. Uh, we can't hear the audio of her video. We'll try that one more time. Thank you everyone for your patience. <clears throat> it's so nice to see her in the video, even if she, uh, it's recorded. She's one of our participants, like many of you, uh, who has offered this service this time for our webinar. That the Earth's resources are meant for everyone's benefit and the care for our common home, a principle highlighted in Paul Friday in the the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God, source of all being. Jesus, our brother. Holy Spirit, our sanctifier. Three persons in one. You bless us with integral ecology and Catholic social teaching. Integral ecology is a key concept within Catholic social teaching that highlights the deep connections between all aspects of creation. It acknowledges that the well-being of the environment is closely linked to both social and spiritual health. This perspective underscores that environmental care extends beyond mere stewardship to encompass justice, human dignity, and solidarity with the less fortunate. Catholic social teaching is a framework developed by the Catholic Church to address various social, economic, and environmental challenges from a moral standpoint. CST emphasizes environmental protection as part of a wider commitment to justice, peace, and the common good. Essential principles include the universal distribution of goods, which suggests that the Earth's resources are meant for everyone's benefit, and the care for our common home, a principle highlighted in Pope Francis' encyclica Laudato Si. This encyclica calls for a respectful and a responsible approach to environmental stewardship. Creator of every visible and invisible, we express our gratitude for the gift of this magnificent world and all its inhabitants. We recognize our duty as caretakers of your creation, entrusted with the responsibility to protect the earth and its resources. Bless us with the wisdom to live in balance with the natural world, the strength to defend the environment, and the empathy to support those most impacted by ecological damage. Guide us to understand our deep connections with all living beings and to act with fairness in love as we strive to protect the well-being of our shared home. Inspire us to adapt the principles of integral ecology. Collaborate towards a sustainable and just world and value the deep beauty and dignity of your creation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 
Thank you, Sister Helen. Now I'll, in, I'll invite the director of the Laudato Si Action Platform, John Mandel, to share a few words with us. Greetings and good day, everyone, especially to everyone here on our webinar. Seeing the world come together these last two weeks at the Olympics has given me a great amount of hope that it is possible for all of us to begin to see each other as brothers and sisters who can come together in peace for a common purpose. And for each of us today, we have a common purpose, our goal to inspire positive action for our planet and all that it holds. Today, we are spending some time thinking about how our core beliefs can lead to action and achieve measurable changes in our footprint on our planet. Why do this? It comes down to one word, motivation. The motivation to act and undergo an ecological conversion can come from many places. Most fundamentally, from a place of deep understanding of who we are as people of faith sharing this planetary space, where each of us see our personal, very personhood through the common lens of family members rather than disassociated strangers. Part of that comes from our visceral experience of the world around us through our senses, what we see, what we hear, what we smell and touch, and our own discovery that behind everything are the fingerprints of our parent, the creator. And so let's begin our daily workout, just like Olympic athletes, connecting to everything around us becoming in our event becoming like this our, our event is the connection with everything just like the athletes train day after day to become the best of who they are so too our goal is to become the champions of community gathering kindred spirits that keep each other on track setting new goals and targets to reach monitoring our progress and encouraging and challenging one another to become the personal change that leads to the cultural change that is needed. Of course, each of us has our own personal training challenges that are unique to us and must be overcome. For example, our own inertia that says to us, it's easier for me just to keep doing what I've always done. Or a feeling of insignificance that whispers to us, what I do really doesn't matter or our limited resources allocated to other things that reminds us, I don't have the time or money to do it that way. Or the uncertainty that comes from the restricted knowledge that ask us, where do I even start? And of course, this uncertainty of faith that asks us, what does this have to do with my own faith? Finally, our lack of authority. Well, my local bishop, priest, rabbi, or imam doesn't support it. So how do we overcome these challenges? How do we start? We're going to hear more about that, but here are a couple of final tips. Don't try to boil the ocean. It's too big for you alone. Just boil your own cup of tea. In other words, don't try to save the world. Just try to save your world, your city your neighborhood, your home. Finally, let's continue to connect with the future through young people, in some cases our own children and grandchildren, our nieces and nephews or our students. I was recently in Brazil this last month with over 5,000 young people from more than 50 countries who believe a different kind of world is possible. I now have 5,000 more reasons to change, to act, to convert. So let's get started today. Back to you, Sarah. Thanks for that message. Now I'd like to introduce our first main speaker, Father Peter Rajic from the Integral Ecology Research Network of the Laudato Si Research Institute at University of Oxford. Father Peter Rajic is a Jesuit priest who currently serves as the director of the Integral Ecology Research Network at the Laudato Si Research Institute at the University of Oxford. 
His academic journey spans university institutions, including Georgetown, Santa Clara, Ljubljana, and now Oxford, bringing a wealth of expertise in environmental and transitional justice, leadership, and network building. Previously, he directed Georgetown's Environmental Justice Program and the Jesuit European Social Center in Brussels. Father Peter's contribu contributions to environmental justice and leadership aligned with the IERN's mission, fostering transdisciplinary research with international scholars and practitioners of integral ecology. Father Peter, we look forward to hearing more from you about some of the initiatives of the research network, as well as the theological foundations of integral ecology that lead toward commitment uh, to ecological stewardship. So I'll pass the mic to you. Thank you very much, Sarah, and hello to everyone online. Greetings to all the athletes, if I may use the language that John Mandel just said about uh, the Olympics. Maybe some of us are Olympic athletes, but I think all of us are Laudato Si athletes. I really much like the uh, comparison. And please allow me now to share the slides, and I hope you can see them well. So thanks for joining this important discussion on connecting faith and action. And I'm honored to represent the Laudato Si Research Institute at Oxford University. Today I'll be discussing Catholic social teaching and the logical foundations of integral ecology research and how they guide us towards a committed science-based ecological stewardship. So let us begin with some data. You can see just this last year, Mexico experienced a record in hot days. Our global socio-environmental crisis continues to escalate. It's, of course, different in different parts of the world. And we can see how, from a variety of contexts, we see the impacts on us as well as on future generations. There is a justice and historical transitional justice perspective here important too looking at specific countries or nations that have emitted so far tremendous numbers in terms of CO2 equivalent emissions that heavily contribute to climate change. The picture of this year, of course, would be different if we just take a snapshot with China leading and other countries behind. And it's important to see these data. It's also important to see data from the justice perspective of equality or the lack of. You can see on this graph how much of CO2 equivalent emissions are emitted, not just by the 1% of the most wealthy, but in fact, by the 0.1%. You can see how many tons of CO2 they would emit. We can afford only two tons per year with regards to the Climate Cop in Paris Agreement uh, so that we can stay below 1.5 degrees Celsius change that would still have us live on a healthy planet. And we may be lacking in achieving this. And if we continue to admit this, the bill will come. And unfortunately, not necessarily to us, but to the future generations. You can see a little baby there, toddler actually, receiving the bill for something he didn't eat or drink. And there is a huge mess around the table. Let me say a few words about Laudato Si Research Institute and the Integral Ecology Research Network that we are launching within our team. We, did, we are dedicated to advancing integral ecology through research and action as well as leadership. And we aim to build uh, a bridge in the gap between theology, ecology, and social sciences, so that we can help promote sustainable practices and policies. You can see the team on our picture, as well as photos from one or a few of our global 
activities. Let me say a few words about the theological foundations of integral ecology. Integral ecology is a holistic approach that links environmental, economic, social, and cultural issues. And it's deeply rooted in Catholic social teaching and Pope Francis's encyclical Laudato Si. This framework helps us to understand the interconnectedness of our creation and the importance of caring for our common home. It is rooted in Catholic social teaching in the following ways that it talks about creation as a gift of God. It talks about our own role as humans, as stewards of creation. It talks about ecological sin, that harm against creation is harm against God, against everybody, and especially the most vulnerable. And we talk about a few principles such as common good, solidarity, and subsidiarity. And so we as scientists, researchers, and so would like to see what kind of paradigm are we looking through when we look at the reality. And the closest that comes to mind when we speak of integral ecology is transdisciplinarity. We're in broader terms, we say that such a research methodology is deeply inter interconnected. It's interdependent, it's interacting and evolving through complex systems in our reality. If you look at this um, picture here, you could see a few of different approaches how scientists tackle different problems. Uh, through multidisciplinary approaches where problem is in the center and other sciences or disciplines uh, kind of try to look at it. Uh, or through a more interdisciplinary approach where scientists work together, uh, different disciplines, and then look at the solution. Or they also, as a, in a transdisciplinary approach, in fact, not only work together as different disciplines, but also with local stakeholders uh, those that participate in research, those that are uh, examined in the research, and so on. So in a nutshell, transdisciplinarity, I know it's a long, complicated word, integrates knowledge systems. It also co-creates knowledge. It's not just about scientists, but also about uh, politicians, community members, church members, the poor, the indigenous, the planet itself. It emphasizes the importance of epistemic diversity, and it's also sensitive to different sociocultural aspects, and it has ethical considerations. What we do at the Laudato Si Research Institute is in fact action research. The key elements would be participation. So it involves community members as active participants in research and decision-making. It's iterative, so it uses cycles of planning and action and observation, as well as reflection. And then it has practical focus. It aims to solve real world problems and improve communities well-being. Now let us go to integral ecology. So we know that it has roots in Pope Francis's Laudato Si, uh, on care of our common home, as well as Fratelli Tutti and Laudate Deum and their other documents that are important for us to understand better what integral ecology is. In a nutshell, we could say everything is connected. And the Pope talks about it. Sciences need to be connected. People need to be connected. But challenges too are connected. So we are in a sense invited to break boundaries to find holistics, holistic solutions. Integral ecology, in a sense, looks at what is the weakest of the others in the center. And so it develops pillars to guide holistic actions for systemic change to overcome socio-ecological injustice. And it's theologically rooted. It pursues what you've heard today already, 
ecological conversion, which we think is needed for systemic change. And it helps build in ourselves a sort of a cr critical and creative consciousness so that we can be engaged as a community. So in a nutshell, what integral ecology brings together perhaps for the first time in history in terms of relating it to sciences, research and action is that we want to hear both the cry of the earth as well as the cry of the excluded, of the marginalized, of the poor. In fact, they're very closely related. Pope has said several times, and I've heard him in person, speaking about Laudato Si, not as a green encyclical, but he refers to it as a social encyclical. Things are connected. And so that we can then respond to this cry of the earth and cry of the poor, we need to go ourselves, all of us, through ecological conversion. This comes down to our broken relationships with God, with one another. We talked about inequality. We talked about injustice. And also with regards to God. And this we can do because we now know from a very important papal document, yes, everything is connected. What we do at LSRI, very briefly, we have launched the Integral Ecology Research Network, um, and our first project there is called Loving Our Land and the Neighbor. And it's wonderful to see scientists coming together from a theological perspective, looking at what agroecology, regenerative practices, and so would be. We work closely with the FAO, with other partners, tremendous potential in doing research with women and religious, because we know there are uh, wonderful practices coming from those orders, but not only. We look at uh, different prizes that we can afford and offer to students when it comes to business uh, research as well as eco-spirituality and so forth. We collaborate with partners in Uganda and ourselves we, we have also launched a few fellowships including one called Integral Ecology Visiting Fellowship and please consider applying in the next few years uh, and come uh, live with us and work with us in Oxford. We have published quite a few reports recently um, one with the World Resources Institute. So it's great to speak today to you with uh, together with Alberto. This was on faith-based participation in natural resource governance. But we have other books out, um, pop, um, research articles, media mentions, and so forth. Just this was our last seminar with World Resources Institute and Ford Foundation showcasing the results of our work and we have found, for example, that spirituality is so foundational. And if that is broken, then also our relationship with God will be broken, as well as the relationship with the creation. We have been uh, given a few research grants. Of course, we um, work with our partners that can sustain our work. And here you can see a different ones, such as the Temple, uh, John Templeton Foundation, Qatar Foundation, and so on, for different types of work. And we also offer a number of courses at the University of Oxford. We are privileged to teach um, very good students. We have helped co-organize the Ecclesia Networks Alliance meeting last summer. It was just a wonderful thing to come together from different groups and networks, as well as the indigenous, where we saw integral ecology as transdisciplinary in its essence. And we try to do something similar this summer with scientists in Switzerland with a Jesuit institute there called La Salle Institute. We've been present at COPS, uh, both climate change and biodiversity. And this is a meeting we organized in March with hundreds of theologians thinking about the possibility of introducing the Feast of Creation um, in the churches, including the Catholic Church. This is a meeting with a faith-based group that goes to Cali, Colombia for the Biodiversity COP, and we are preparing it together. And just recently, we have launched so-called Integral Ecology Dialogues with a number of wonderful partners, researchers, and so that work on the intersection of theology and agroecology. And then just an invitation, we'll be having a few festivals around the world in the next few months. If you are around or online, please join us. So thank you very much. And back to you, Sarah.
Thank you, Father Peter. <laughs> there would be so much to share. I know it's it's uh, hard in a small, short amount of time, uh, but it's so wonderful to see all that is happening and uh, this way of looking at ecology really through that lens of our faith and how many people are involved in that. So uh, we are going to now introduce our second main speaker. Uh, we've invited Alberto Palecci, who's the head of the Faith and Sustainability Initiative for the World Resources Institute. As the head of the, the Faith and Sustainability Initiative, Alberto supports existing and new faith-based projects in the area of sustainability and enables faith-based communities to identify ideas and programs that build capacity for community level solutions to sustainability challenges. Alberto has worked for the Technical Center for Agriculture and Rural Cooperation, an international development organization, the European University Institute, which is a research institute, and also interned for a Justice Institute in The Hague, the Italian General Consulate in Miami, and a human rights NGO in Italy. He has a master's degree in political science from La Sapienza University in Rome, another from international communication from Hans University in Groningen, and a bachelor's in political science from Roma Tre University. So Alberto, we're looking forward to hearing from you today and uh, what you have to share with us, especially regarding the science-based targets for faith organizations. I'll pass the mic to you. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah, for uh, uh, the nice introduction. And uh, thanks also to Peter and to John uh, for the uh, inspiring word. And uh, hello, everybody. It is uh, great uh, to be here today. Uh, very glad for the invitation from our friends at the Laudato Si Movement and the Laudato Si Action Platform. I hope you can see my presentation correctly. Uh, I work for the World Resources Institute, or, or WRI in short. Uh, it's a global research organization that uh, works to bring big ideas into action uh, at the nexus of environment, uh, development, and human well-being. Uh, we have established since a few years, since 2021, uh, a faith and sustainability initiative that specifically look at the world of faith-based organizations and works uh, for a world where faith-based organizations uh, activate themselves as climate leaders, try to utilize their influence and assets in a way uh, that is environmentally and societally positive uh, with the, our uh, world boundaries. Uh, so uh, what has uh, an organization like WRI, very secular, very uh, focused on data and science, has to do with the world of faith? A uh, few years ago, uh, uh, we looked at how the world was going and the presentation that uh, also Peter was making about uh, that, that we are losing tracks uh, with uh, uh, the, the, the objective of sustainable development. And we realized uh, that there is a huge potential uh, of engaging faith-based organizations around sustainability. A uh, lot of people associated with the religion worldwide, out of eight out of 10 people about religion always being an important vehicle for what people uh, love, embrace, and protect. Uh, and basically all religion, if uh, almost all, if not all, uh, see uh, faith, uh, see the earth as a divine creation that requires uh, uh, responsible stewardship. Uh, there are also some challenges associated uh, to engaging faith-based organizations around science and uh, science-based action. Uh, of course, uh, we have seen a lot of engagement in the faith realm, a lot of uh, motivation, as John was mentioning, uh, but very often very little uh, or very few examples uh, of uh, science-based, uh, evidence-based commitment. There are still quite some gaps in terms of uh, uh, faith-based capacity for project planning and project management. Uh, while the challenge is huge, uh, we realize that uh, we need all hands on deck uh, to push uh, the global community, politicians, governments uh, to maintain the commitments around the Sustainable Development Goal and the Paris Agreement. Uh, so we came up with this idea to uh, try to bring faith-based organizations uh, as a, a major actor for uh, climate mitigation. And we established this project, SBTF, or Science-Based Target for Faith, uh, that really has a, as its own main goal 
uh, to uh, advance a global standard for faith-based organizations to measure, manage, and report their greenhouse gas emission in a way that is aligned to the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, we developed this project uh, that had three main goals. First of all, looking at uh, physical assets. And when we talk about physical assets, we're talking about buildings, we're talking about vehicle fleets, but really trying to uh, assess the emission impact of faith-based organization worldwide. Uh, then uh, look at how faith-based organization uh, may set their own target. So uh, pilot and develop some faith-specific methodologies uh, that uh, can be used by faith-based organizations to uh, drive action in a way that is aligned to the latest science. And also developing a place where all this data can be collected uh, and bring together into action. It sounds super technical uh, again, and you might wonder uh, what is actually the, the scope of the project, how even to define what we say uh, an FBO is, a faith-based organization. Uh, we are here taking a very extensive definition. Uh, Faith-based organizations uh, in uh, the faith and sustainability domain are defined as uh, all those uh, organizations, institutions or actors whose values and mission are driven by a spiritual or religious belief. So it's really an umbrella term uh, that include from schools to congregation to charities, social service providers uh, that aims to uh, achieve a spiritual, cultural, or social need of uh, their own communities. Uh, again, why faith-based organizations? Uh, because we feel that faith-based organizations are uniquely positioned to contribute uh, to climate uh, mitigation uh, by inspiring environmental actions around the world, uh, given the scale of assets they have influence over and their ability to forge what people value embrace and protect. Think about, for example, the financial assets uh, that faith-based organizations control around the world. Think about the community impact uh, that uh, faith-based organizations bring, or again, the real assets uh, that they uh, manage uh, or control. Faith-based organizations are actually already uh, tracking emissions, and here I'm showing uh, some of uh, the uh, major uh, initiatives out there from the Laudato Si Action Platform, but there are also others that have been trying in the last few years to work uh, around emissions and to push faith-based organization action uh, on, on climate. But obviously, there is still quite some gap uh, between advocacy and, and practice, and I will uh, shortly show you what are the main challenges around this. Uh, obviously, we're talking about assets, uh, and think about uh, uh, the assets that the faith-based organizations control or manage around the world. This is a very diverse set of assets. Uh, it's not really a, a narrow industry sector category, but we're talking about a very different type of uh, entities from uh, uh, land to uh, places of worship, like churches, mosques, mosques uh, to residential, hospitality, commercial, education, like university, school, or healthcare, uh, many, many hospitals, solar care uh, organizations around the world are managed by faith-based organizations. And when it comes to these key questions, uh, how many assets uh, are, are out there that are controlled to faith-based organizations? We cannot really give a, a definitive answer to this question, but we've tried to undertake an, a simple literature review, a simple literature search uh, to begin answering these questions. And these are just some working estimate that we came up with about 6 million buildings uh, around the world. Think about all the buildings in New York City and multiply by six. Uh, those are the buildings that we expect are controlled by faith-based organizations. Or again, how much land is controlled by faith-based organization? We expect 175 million hectares of land uh, are in somehow, some way uh, managed by faith-based organizations. That's slightly less than the size of Mexico. So it's a, it's a huge uh, figure. Uh, Faith-based organizations are obviously at the early stage of practice of disclosing their energy and, and carbon associated with their assets. For many organizations, this might be uh, brand new. But the nexus between uh, uh, climate change and faith action is incredibly visible. Uh, Faith-based organizations are very often mission-driven, community-oriented, 
And very often they work uh, at the front line of climate adaptation with the marginalized or with uh, communities uh, or with people in needs. Uh, the quality and verifiability of data is an obvious challenge. Uh, and again, uh, we are trying to innovate here. We're trying to bring something new into the sector to showcase the potential of faith-based organization to contribute to climate. Uh, but for uh, many of you, this might sound uh, something that your communities are not used to do. Uh, what do we have to do with climate or energy? But this is a growing field with a very big potential. And I will show you how. Uh, we are doing this because we believe uh, that there is a great potential, of course. Uh, the value associated with collecting and reporting of data can have different uh, repercussions on a faith-based organization. First of all, for a direct impact on your finances, obviously. Uh, you, we used to say in the field that you cannot manage uh, what you don't measure. Uh, it can help to uh, attain goals to advance missions. There are some communities, some churches, uh, some dioceses that have come up with some strong commitments around climate. There is obviously a, a point around education and advocacy, so building community of practices and even managing risks, because there are many risks associated with energy, uh, with uh, the, the, the impact of climate. Uh, so by starting to measure uh, and, and manage uh, a, a community, a, a mission, may have some direct uh, positive repercussion on the uh, vital of vitality of the church. So we came up with this document, Science-Based Target uh, for Faith Technical Guidance document is published, is out there. Uh, you can find it easily by uh, just typing on Google Science-Based Target for Faith, and you will find our first version from March. That really does a few things. Uh, it explains how to compile a greenhouse gas inventory. It uh, basically uh, drives uh, uh, people that wants to start this journey on how to set science-based targets, so targets that are aligned with the science, what to do after setting the targets. Uh, and it provides also a, a survey uh, that you can fill uh, in order to gather all the information that you need uh, from your utility bills, from your uh, energy and gas, uh, suppliers. Uh, it's fairly easy and probably way much easier than it sounds. Uh, obviously, we uh, designed some principle. We wanted it to be simple. Uh, we wanted to be flexible. Uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, it is aligned with the latest science, but at the same time, uh, that is uh, accessible uh, and uh, allows, uh, for example, uh, other tool uh, to be used. Uh, there are many people, for example, using the APA Portfolio Manager or any other type of organizations using some other measuring tool, and this tool allows uh, interoperability. Uh, we run this pilot with a number of faith-based organizations uh, in different geographies, uh, from the Episcopal Church in the Philippines to the Diocese of Nyeri in Kenya, uh, the Episcopal Church in the New York State of the United States, and the St. Peter Basilica in Rome, just to try to showcase uh, that it was possible uh, to follow science, uh, to measure, track, and report the mission, and to set targets for their mitigation. Lastly, obviously, I understand that there are many challenges uh, for uh, communities, uh, some uh, struggling with capacity uh, to uh, undertake these challenges. There are multiple types of, uh, of assets out there. There are limited uh, data availability. Uh, there is a question around capacity that was also mentioned already. And sometimes even a lack of education or expertise around this. This project tries to be a first step uh, for faith-based organization uh, to acquire some knowledge, to establish community of practice, and to simply try it out. Uh, if you have that commitment, that motivation that John was mentioning, give it a try. Just go and uh, give it a look uh, and see what you can do in your community. Every data is good data and every step is critical uh, to take us where we want to be uh, to uh, achieve uh, the, the Paris Climate Accord. Thank you very much for following. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Alberto. This is so interesting. Both of you have had just very thought-provoking presentations, and I know people would love to hear more. We have included the link to the document of science-based targets for faith organizations. 
uh, and we can put that in again to make sure, and that will also be uh, in the recording on YouTube. If you see, uh, we can put that in the comments there. Um, we are not gonna have time for questions, but please do go to that document. Uh, some of the examples that he was starting to give are, are really great targeting, measuring energy use and land use and all of these different um, assets that our faith communities already have. And it's a, such a, a big opportunity because of the large size of our faith community, faith communities. Um, we are uh, unfortunately need to wrap up our time with this section of our presentation today. Um, we do have the community meeting coming up for those who would like to participate and we'll put the link in the chat to, if you haven't registered for that yet, you can still register for that. Uh, really a huge thank you to our speakers uh, Father Peter and Alberto, uh, and we would hope we can hear more from you and we'll be following your work. Uh, thank you to our translators and our tech team who are working behind the scenes to make this webinar possible. And all of you who are here participating, we hope that we've given you some food for thought, or you can uh, at least uh, kind of know some things. I'm, I need to go and look up more about that. Oh, I, I want to, there's a lot going on. Let me go find out more about what's happening at the Research Institute and so on. So please do look that up. If you have not yet signed up for the Laudato Si Action Platform, I encourage you to go to www.laudatosiactionplatform.org, check us out, consider registering and uh, make sure to uh, join us next month. Uh, we'll be having our next webinar on September 5th, celebrating the season of creation, which is has the theme of hope and act with creation. So our webinar next month on September 5th will uh, have some great guest speakers related to that theme. And again, uh, for those of you who can join us in about 10 minutes, we'll start our community meeting at the Zoom link that's connected to the other registration for the community meeting. Thank you so much and uh, see you next month or see you soon if you can join us in the community meeting. Take care, everyone. Take care.